everybody. I'm super excited for today's show. We've got not not one dope CFO, but two here. Um, so we'll we'll have a lot to cover. We have Betsy Morham CPA and Mark Waller CPA, the co-founders of Morham and Waller CPAs, um, here. And really excited to see that they've been in the the space for quite some time. They've been a dope CFO for quite some time. And so really excited to to see their take on the industry. They're also in Minnesota, which is is not the biggest cannabis state for certain. Um, and um, hear about that as well. So why don't we jump in? I'm going to let each of you, um, why don't we start, Betsy, with you, and then we'll go to Mark and introduce yourself and and then also kind of your background and, and how that even led you into cannabis accounting as well. All right. Well, thank you again for having us on the podcast. Um, and so my name is Betsy Moram. I um, live in Southern Minnesota, um, Austin, Minnesota, to be specific. Some refer to it as Spam Town USA, uh, <laughs> lovingly. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I ended up, I, I lived in Minneapolis for quite some time and then ended up meeting my husband and, and came down here. Um, but I have a young family and I've, I've been in the accounting space for about eight years now. Um, started as a bookkeeper. I, my first degree was not in accounting. Um, it was actually in Spanish and international relations. Well, cool. And I, I kind of quickly realized I didn't have a very you know clear vision of where I was headed with that. Um, so I ended up becoming interested in accounting through a close personal relationship of mine at the time. And I decided to take a, an accounting class at a, at a local university and found that I really enjoyed it. And I shouldn't have been surprised by that because I was really into numbers as a kid. Just to kind of tell you a really dorky story about myself. Um, I used to call my friends and I would ask them to give me two um, two digit numbers and I would multiply it in my head. And it was like this game that I would play with my friends and they were so <laughs> nice to play along with me, but it's kind of funny <laughs> looking back. Um, so... Yeah, so I just sort of evolved, um, you know, my skills and knowledge over time. Eventually, I had enough credits to sit for the CPA exam, um, took that, passed it. And um, and how I got into the cannabis industry, you know, I, I happened upon the Dope CFO program um, probably at least three years ago. And I don't even know how, if it just came up on my Facebook or what, but I looked into it. And I was really interested in it um, because I thought it could be kind of a, a, a cool um, niche for me, something that not a, a lot of account of it, accountants are in, but an industry that desperately needed good accountants. So um, I didn't actually join Dope CFO till uh, after I passed my CPA exams. And um, I really enjoyed working in the cannabis industry so far, and it's been really rewarding. Well, that's a, a great background. We'll turn it yeah. over to Mark. I had similar where I didn't go originally in college to that. I went back to night school, community college. And oh, just, really? Just take more and more credits. Like, oh, this is fun. Yeah. And, and so it's never too late to start. I tell people it's yeah. yay when I was 29, I think. So that was about, uh, well, not, not, I mean, pretty close, a couple of years off, <laughs> but just out of curiosity, what was your first degree? It was in fi just kind of business. It was really okay. finance, but it was very yeah. generic. And I just feel like it was just they glazed over a lot of topics. It was just it felt it seemed easy at the time. I was I was more interested in having fun in college the first time around. Yeah. The second time I was like, oh, what do I actually want to do? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Same. <so that's> <laughs> well, Mark, jump in now. Let's hear about your background as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, similarly, I, you know, I, I started um, my college career not thinking I was going to be majoring in accounting, but I, uh, I kind of, I went to business school and, and kind of evolved to, in my first accounting class, I was like, this is actually kind of interesting. Um, my grandfather was, was a controller, um, like World War II vet and a, a, an accountant his whole career. So I knew a little bit about it, but um, kind of drew, found myself drawn to it and kind of the intersection between um, accounting and management information systems was uh, at the time Sarbanes Oxley was like was the big thing. And so that's I was kind of drawn to accounting um, as a double major in accounting and MIS and then ended up kind of 
being looking at public accounting jobs out of college and was really enjoying the client piece of that. Um, I actually like similarly to Betsy, um, like looking back as a kid, I remember sitting in my in my bedroom um, as like, you know, three or four years old or maybe, you know, around that and sorting my baseball cards in like numerical order. <laughs> Um, and so, and, and like, as I think about it, it's like, really, as it comes down to it, like, that's really all accounting is, is sorting your baseball cards. So, yeah, really. uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, it's something I, I, I really found that I, I loved, but, um, you know, starting my career in a, at a smaller accounting firm, um, in college, had an internship at a, at a, at a small accounting firm, really loved working with clients. I got a lot of opportunities really young to work with clients, actually got to travel a little bit uh, working with uh, credit unions um, back in, you know, like early part of the end, end of the, the first decade of the 2000s. And um, and then I went to uh, worked as a controller uh, in in uh, the nonprofit sector for about 10 years. Um, but got to a point, my my family is, uh, I have a young family as well, um, but my kids got a little bit older. And uh, when the pandemic hit, I was kind of thinking like, I, I need to do another career shift to get back to public accounting, uh, but kind of do it on my terms. And, um, you know, looking into Dope CFO, actually, the reason Betsy and I ended up connecting and eventually starting a firm is because... Um, is because of Dope CFO and and because I, I reached out to her and said you know have, have you heard of Dope CFO and um, that's when she mentioned oh you know I actually looked at it myself so um, that was kind of the spark that got us to the point where now we both started our firm um, we just cel celebrated our our firm's two year anniversary um, and uh, have grown a ton since we first started and joined um, so it's been really rewarding. Um, the cannabis industry in general, you know, like Betsy said, like, um, I also, you know, I have a passion for the industry. It's just, as I've gotten okay. to know people in the industry, it's just been amazing to get to know people in the industry. Um, it's just, it, it's exciting. Um, it's kind of, you know, I, I tend to go for things a little bit off the beaten path. So certainly, <laughs> you know, you're not going to see the big four, you know, many yeah. firms working with them. So, um, you know, my only regret really is that I didn't, uh, start doing this sooner honestly. <laughs> well, that's, mm -hmm. that's really good to hear. And, and you already kind of hit the second question, which was, <laughs> how did you all get together? And I think, did you all, you had worked together previously um, yeah. in public accounting? So we had actually worked together. We, we met once in 2015 and um, we met because of a, 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 a mutual client. So Mark was doing the 990 tax prep for this client. I was doing the bookkeeping. And over time, I ended up sending more of these nonprofit clients for to Mark to do the 990 prep. Um, so yeah, we I guess that was seven years ago now that we met, but even to, uh even so that we've been uh, together in this partnership um for a couple of years now. We've maybe seen each other in person like ten times. So. <laughs> yeah, it's it's mostly on Zoom. Yeah, and yeah. It's, um, part of part of the 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 spark for creating the firm this way <laughs> is because it is virtual, and so that's yeah. I think uh, you know starting a a firm is challenging itself, but um, I think actually in a lot of ways it's it being virtual is uh, has made it a little bit easier. I think yeah. than it would be otherwise absolutely well and and why don't we hit that right now on the virtual side because that to me is a huge thing i talked mm -hmm. to so many accountants and most all of them are are saying yeah they would love to be remote they want to work remote um and you all are obviously doing it um why don't you hit that right now what is the uh, how has that worked remote i know still today we have we have pushed back, you know, I was helping someone over in Oregon get a client and it wasn't, he wasn't even that far away. He was in Portland. It was kind of like mm. being outside Minneapolis. He's like a right. 45 minute drive. And they're like, well, do you have anyone closer? And I was just yeah. like, have you all had any pushback with that as well of educating these um, business owners? <laughs> you know, we, we really haven't seen a whole lot of pushback. I our client concentration is on the East coast. Um, and when we tell people that we're, when we clarify, we're located in Minnesota, people seem surprised, but that doesn't seem to be, um, 
a game, a game changer for them. I think we have maybe lost a couple of clients to them wanting, preferring to work with somebody locally, but we always explain in our, um, in our calls with prospective clients that we have set up our system so that everything can be accomplished virtually. Um, and, and we think that we can be more efficient and productive. I always tell people that I get way more done working by myself without interruptions than being in an office setting. I think there is a lot of value in that face-to-face time. And I do still think that's important in a virtual setting. But um, you kind of avoid the uh, several hours of small talk that typically happens in an office setting. Yeah, and that's a great way to frame it where it's like, Look, if we're if I'm driving back and forth, and then we have mm-hmm. small talk, and I'm going to say hi to everyone. It's not even accounting, and then right. interrupted. Um, I tell people, even though there was a point, even here in Oregon, where I had a client a mile away, and I was just like, "This is a total. I'm not getting any work done. I might go over there once a month for three, four hours, and it wasn't any any work." And with with Zoom in this day and age, you can get that FaceTime, so that's good to hear. And I tell clients too at the end of the day. You know, you really want really good accounting and tax, yeah. CFO services, you know. And so if if I can do a better job over here, as opposed to someone who comes and sees you every single day, but does a really poor job, which is what most of the industry has, um, mm-hmm. what do you really want? Um, I've, I've got a blog somewhere about that, about how they say they want sit, someone sitting next to them, but what they really want yeah. is good accounting. Yeah. Um, they want someone sitting next to them till they realize that person sitting next to them is doing a bad job. <laughs> and yeah. Then- and I'll even say too, I think some people who prefer someone being on site, to me, that is sort of a red flag um, because maybe they're more of a micromanager. Um, and I don't want to be micromanaged. I want people to trust in me to do my job. And we're at a point now where we can, we can seek out our ideal clients. Um we, I mean, in the beginning, you're, you're really trying to get any business that you can and you're thankful for it. But I think over time, you really start to hone in on, I want to work with these type of clients and I'm willing to say no if they don't fit that. Um, well, that that's a perfect role into our next question. And Mark, why don't you start with this one mm-hmm. um, about what are some of the most common bookkeeping blunders and or more than just bookkeeping, accounting and or tax? It, it's all related. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. especially, yeah. especially in this industry. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think still the most common thing I see is um, either a, you know month's worth of financial data not reconciled, not touched, or, uh, you know, owners that haven't opened a bank account or have opened a bank account, but have paid for things out of pockets and not included those transactions. Um, that I think you know, one of the things that we really stress and, and we a little bit preferable, although we can work with anybody, is to be able to work with a, with a cannabis client from scratch really uh, makes a huge difference for us and for them because uh, we can start them off on the right foot versus, um, you know, having a huge backlog is just like, as we, as we all know, as accountants, that it can be really painful. Yeah. Have you all, let me ask you this, because I have never, have you ever seen a cannabis client that actually had accurate, complete, timely, <laughs> no, nah, your not prospect you, or your clients. <laughs> no, yeah, not, none that are that were in existence prior to uh, us. It, and the ones I do, the ones that do, uh, you know, I've, we've had a few who you know were helping kind of uh, for the type of client that maybe you know started off thinking things are going to go a certain way, and it's just been slower, but um, they're still at least kind of organized. Um, it's, it's truly like, it's a huge pleasure to work with those types of clients where, where they can kind of walk you through what they've done. And, uh, if there's just a list of, you know, like two or three things that they have questions about, that's to me, that's like, oh, that actually gives me kind of warm fuzzies. (laughs) (laughs) So there, um, well, well, that's great to hear as well. Um, and we're seeing this even with pretty sizable companies too. So I think it it adds a ton of value. Um, what about on onboarding? So let's say they're not, uh, well, either way, startup or a non-startup kind of what does your onboarding process look like, um, for getting started? 
Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, Betsy and I sat down and, you know, I've, we, we have the tools from dope CFO. We have the onboarding checklist that we use um, ourselves, but we also put together kind of a, as part of our whole onboarding process, put together our own process of, of getting them started. And that includes, you know, sending them the onboarding checklist from dope CFO right away, but it also includes, um, you know, sending them a welcome video. It kind of like kind of a warm welcome to them, getting that appointment on the calendar right away. Um, I find, you know, 95% of the battle sometimes is just finding a time to meet and meeting and doing the work. Um, because a lot of the times, if, if you, especially for us, I think if we have time to work through accounting, there's very little that really, once you kind of get into that flow state, um, that you can't solve as an accountant, but it's just, it's just about kind of coordinating those schedules. I think that's one of the biggest things I've, I've learned as a, as a business owner now is that so much of, of your success, uh, both on our firm, but also when we work with cannabis clients is just making time to, to do the work. Well, and I'll add to that. That's it's a couple of great points that I hit right off. I love that you do the welcome video and do it quickly. I've kind of been evolving some of the things I've been been teaching and pitching, especially as we've talked to and heard from more and more business owners and their whether their accounting's horrible or good or bad or whatever, their biggest complaint from their eyes is, oh, my accountant's not available. They're too busy. Yeah. Right? I tell them they don't email me back. And so I started calling it kind of white glove service because I think it's a nice mm -hmm. word. And I love everything in our program is supposed to be tailored or tweakable to make it your own. Like, here's how we onboard and welcome you and let you know immediately that we value you, who you are. Um, because frankly, that is is a hard part getting started sometimes. Um, and Betsy, you can hit this. I'll let you hit this question too. And also how it relates to common complaints we hear from bookkeepers and not just dope CFO. And in, in, I'm in lots of non-cannabis groups is, is getting PBC documents and yeah. getting the stuff we need to actually get started. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. you want to talk I, to that piece as well. Yeah, I think um, we, we've we found that it's it's just as important for our clients to understand what um, our expectations of them are um, when it comes to information gathering, because we can only do our job if they do their job. And so I think what we're continually trying to get better at is um, relaying those expectations to the client and making it clear what information we need and when we need it by so that we can do our job. I think sometimes the hope is that, oh, you guys will just handle everything, yeah. but we can't, you know, we can't uh, go into their old bank records and, and pull data or know what um, transactions they put on their personal account and that sort of thing, or what some, what certain transactions were for. So it's a, it's a collaborative process, um, making sure that that information is, um, done and, and timely as well. So it's always, um, it's, it's rare when it's flows perfectly, but I think as you just kind of get to know your client more and they get to know you and you understand who needs to do what, um, it, it becomes an easier process. And, you know, ultimately if things can't change over a certain period of time, maybe that isn't the ideal client for you. Yeah, you, know, you a couple of great points you made that yeah, sometimes <clears throat> if you I found sometimes maybe a bookkeeper or an accountant will jump in, even though I get a couple of things and they just can't ever get everything they need. Right. And so if that can I've had to fire a client because they just it it actually started to be like, oh, are they actually doing something illegal? They're not giving us access yeah. to what we need. And so we would we would just get them. Another thing I've noticed over time is the lower, and this relates to some other bookkeeping groups I'm in, people that are, are charging 300 a month or 500 a month to do bookkeeping or a thousand, that already tells you the client doesn't place any value on accounting and right. they're going to be harder to yeah. deal with. Um, but if we're, mm -hmm. if we're coming in and saying, Hey, we're, we're going to do the full accounting, this, that, and the other, you know, we're not, we're a very cost-effective solution. Hopefully we're going to provide yeah. real ROI, but, but they'll usually um, do better. So why don't that, this kind of relates into onboarding to cleanup. Um, mm -hmm. when you do have these cleanups, do you all charge differently? I've often charged hourly backwards and, 
are you finding a certain amount of time to, that cleanups take? Um, I've had them go all over the place. <laughs> I I think it's, um, you know, we we do try to charge kind of like an, an hourly rate for cleanup work that needs to be done if there's a whole lot that needs to be done uh, prior to us coming on board. And we, we also kind of treat it as a separate piece from our ongoing piece because it really needs to, it really needs its own focus, I think, um, because it's, it, if you're trying to keep the keep the engine running going forward, but also looking back, it's just it's very challenging to do both at the same time. So um, we yeah, we try to do kind of an hourly rate and usually it's like something like an hourly rate that's capped at a certain number of hours so that we have kind of that um, understanding with each other um, up front. And get the guy give the guidance there. So that's um, great input. Let's go on to um, about this kind of relates. This is actually a little bit before onboarding. So if you're speaking to accountants out there and they're nervous about pitching to cannabis businesses, how do you position yourself to talk to an owner, find owners, talk to them, and and give an, get out an offer to them? Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I th- I think, you know, it's it's for me, it's it's a personal journey a little bit. It's a little bit about, you know, being confident in your abilities. I think we as accountants, we you know, there's definitely a stereotype of accountants being fairly um, you know, probably introverted, not very personable, um, you know, in the numbers or, you know, there's obviously there's there's all kinds of uh uh, pop culture you can see where that's happening <laughs> with the cones um but i i think it's really just about you know being confident in yourself being confident in your abilities um you know the, the first i think the first few times betsy and i pitched to clients together um it's like a huge adrenaline rush in you know positively and and it can be scary but the more you do it the more you just feel comfortable and confident in in your abilities and um you know you grow as a person too when you do that so i think um, you know, I, you know, I, for me personally, I, I like to read a lot of, you know, uh, self-improvement types of books and podcasts and things like that. And, um, you know, both, you know, both about accounting, about, you know, just being a business owner, just about, you know, personally in general, I think all of that stuff that you do, um, as a human to grow, um, helps you do that. So I, I would say, you know, for anybody who's, feeling uh nervous about it just be yourself and and have fun with it and um you know you the more you do it the more comfortable you are with it why don't we um betsy why don't we hit that same question to you and then i'd also be interested to know because i do this is another common theme even the people not in a program i talk to them on the phone oftentimes one of the very first questions i get is Hey, Andrew, I'm great on accounting, but I'm just, I hate either hate marketing or I'm terrified. Which of the the two of you likes the marketing more? Do you all, because you're both pretty outgoing and very personable. Do you all split that up or do you all, do you all both like it? So it's funny that you asked that because we were just talking about that earlier today. I I think we both really enjoy the sales and marketing process. (laughs) Um, We are, we have the two, Mark and I have different strengths. Um, that that happen to work really well together. And um, <clears throat> so I guess as an example, I might get really excited about something and Mark kind of reels me back in, you know? <laughs> so we we balance out each other well, um, but I think we both really enjoy it and we both want to continue to focus more of our time on that. We've been really lucky in that a lot of our new business has been referral-based. And so we haven't had to put a ton of effort into um, you know, traditional sales and marketing um, uh, initiatives. But um, <clears throat> Mark, would you have anything to add to yeah. that? Well, I was going to say, I'll, I'll cut in real quick. That's a great point, the referral base, because I feel personally, one, the baby boomers, of which I'm, I'm at the last year of it, mm-hmm. are CPAs, accountants are aging out. The big firms and even the small firms are 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 too busy. They're not giving great service. And so at the end of the day, it's a pretty simple model. Word of the mouth yeah. is the best advertising. So if I tell people, if you go on backwards and just, yeah, getting client one might take some work, but if you do a great job and you deliver that good product with really good service, um, 
they're going to like you. They're going to, if you do it right, you should, I've never been fired. Um, I talked to an yeah. accountant yesterday on the phone that told me she was like an amazing accountant and she was super nice, but she's been fired eight times. I was like, <laughs> there must be something you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, Mark jumped back into that because that that's ultimately, I tell mm-hmm. people if you do the pieces right, particularly serving the client, marketing should disappear and i think that's the same for you know everyone from price water has some down they just yeah clients are going to come to them yeah i mean i think yeah and i i guess you know it's back up i i definitely agree that we both probably more than typical accountants enjoy the the sales piece but i think uh you know i i tend to think more about you know my from my controller background i'm always thinking of like um, I'm thinking about internal controls all the time. If you, if you hear me on like a, like yeah. I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago, I was listening back to it and I'm like, I could hear my, I can like listen to myself talk about internal controls for like hours at a time. And like <laughs> looking back at it, I'm like, I'm just talking, talking, talking about internal controls. And it's like, <laughs> but so, so like that piece of it is, <clears throat> is exciting. Um, where I think, you know, uh, but we balance each other out, I think, um, mm-hmm. from that because I like Betsy also is like really good about remembering like to ask, you know, how is your kid doing, you know, kind of this, the, <laughs> you know, really good relationship building kind of stuff. But um, that so, yeah, but yeah, I mean, as far as as referral based things too, um, you know, I've just been kind of trying to follow the the VIP model in Dope CFO of just getting out there and meeting people. And so I've been. Mm-hmm fortunate to be part of a, a few networking groups in um, on the East Coast that are just about, you know, bringing accountants and attorneys and bankers and insurance people together uh, who all work with cannabis businesses and just getting to know them and seeing them then kind of following that up with meeting them at things like MJ Biz and, uh, you know, other conferences around the country. Um, it just, you know, there's there's just like a whole community out there um, you know, LinkedIn, all of those things that that you it, eventually you kind of see what the world is and you kind of make your mark. And it's it's, uh, you know, again, like I've I've yet to see anything that's been really less than supportive. And when when there are, are things that are that feel like bad energy or or less than supportive, um, it's easy to to just turn your attention elsewhere because it's um, there's a lot of good good out there, I think, with people that are working in this industry. Well, and that's, I love that part too. And what you said, several things about first and foremost, just it's a great industry. It's a, if you're actually behind the movement, there's a lot of people that believe in the medicine and yeah. the decriminalization and the mm-hmm. social equity and all these different pieces. So instead of just being an accountant, it's like, oh, I'm actually part of something good. Another thing you brought up too, it's actually a lot of fun, this industry. You go to the events and mixers and you meet people and there's always, fun happy hours or meetups or golf tournaments or whatever. And so you can meet, meet these people. And that whole VIP method is you kind of hit on this with the podcast too. the V building that expertise daily. So whether it's in our group or reading or the news, you're always growing your knowledge on both accounting and general business skills, but then cannabis, the whole industry. And then really just, I tell people, immerse yourself, get involved, participate, you know, that, even if you don't have a client to get a referral (laughs) and word of mouth, that's the easiest way to meet these owners and have them be warm leads is actually get out there involved. And then they appreciate that you're actually involved in and helping, whether it could be lobbying effort, you could be mentoring a social equity applicant, you could be joining a group, you could have a networking event. There's just so many ways. And again, a lot of this stuff isn't rocket science. It's, it's fairly simple. And some of it goes way back. Um, Danny and our, our group, Last week, hadn't heard back from a prospect. He's like, I emailed him three times. He's like, I got on the phone and I just called him. He answered and he got his engagement letter signed the same day. Wow. It's it's just, awesome. Some yeah. people don't respond yeah. to emails or they're busy. So yeah. Yeah. sometimes you got to go old school on that. Yeah. Um, we're, yeah. no, we've got some more questions. I'm going to combine a couple that this kind of relates to controls. And Betsy, we can go back to you. You mentioned, some of these things that clients, these, these, and this isn't just cannabis companies that are, that are growing really rapidly. I saw this in mm-hmm. tech startups too. They're growing fast. They're focused on marketing and their product and people and all these balls up in the air. And they don't really understand there's a difference in between bookkeeping and, oh, 
controls and audit ready financials yeah. and supporting doc documentation and online bank information. So maybe talk about that, about how we we try to make sure these clients are audit ready and and a true CFO has those skills like you have learned in public accounting or whatever. Talk about that piece of of how you do the documentation and you're doing more than just entering a transaction in QuickBooks or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's for us, it starts with making it clear to the client what these different roles do um, so that they can start to differentiate what does a controller do versus a bookkeeper versus a, um, a CFO. So I think often people just don't understand what those different roles do and, and you can't really expect them to if they're not in the industry and they're not familiar with it. So um yeah, so we 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 make that clear kind of from the get-go. And then we also um we consider ourselves a very um tech forward firm. So we utilize different technologies to make sure that they are audit ready at any given point. One of the softwares that we use is, is HubDoc. Um, which is a document storage software. And it makes things really easy for the client because it's an app on their phone and they can take pictures of their invoices or receipts and it syncs with our accounting software. Um, and, you know, it, it, in the event of an audit, there the, the auditor would be able to look in the accounting software and see that supporting documentation attached to, to each um, transaction. So it's kind of helping them understand each role and then the technology that we'll be utilizing to make that all sync and happen and how it benefits them as well. Do they, have you all had any pushback? Are they, or are they pretty compliant? You get them on the phone and they actually take the picture or um, do sometimes you have to, to bug them <laughs> a little bit? Hey, you didn't take a picture of that one. Yeah. We have to prompt them still. And I yeah. think that's, I think, you know, yeah. I don't expect them to be perfect. And I think it's also a, a good, um, you know, a good reminder that technology doesn't solve every problem. Um, it, and certainly, you know, if technology, if it's deployed poorly, it can actually just create more problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, you know, we love using technology. Obviously, our whole firm is built on it in a lot of ways. But um, we're also, you know, I think one of the things we've learned over over the time that our firm has evolved is is that 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 um it still comes down to to us as people to to get things done yeah that's a, a really good point about yeah we can have all the systems in the world and i remember showing um call him joe over here at the dispensary he had this beautiful reports out of his pos system is like it doesn't make it right it's like let's we literally <laughs> like oh show me the report we walked over and counted the gummy bears on the shelf yeah and there were eight and then we looked at the reports so there are 10 and then yeah. we found one back oh i have one down here in this drawer to take to my wife or whatever but um right. so just yeah the the software is great it helps us but it doesn't get rid of us um and and Betsy, why didn't that relate yeah. to also accounts payable? What because some people ask about the same, this is another kind of topic, accrual accounting versus cash accounting. Why is it more important to enter the, the bills into the system when as soon as they're due, not when they're paid? Um mm -hmm. and, and keeping them compliant with 280E as well. Yeah, and and I always bring up that example when I'm I am explaining to um prospective clients or existing clients, what is involved with 280E compliance. And so the example I always use is part of um, 280E compliance is, is uh, using gap accounting and gap accounting, you have to use accrual accounting. Here's the difference between accrual and cash basis accounting. And so I'll say, say you receive an invoice from your attorney. It's for services rendered in August, but you don't pay it till September. We have to record that invoice as of August rather than as of September, when you pay it? And so when I give them that simple example, then they they understand um, and you know why it's important for us to have that kind of information at our fingertips as soon as they receive it. So um, I, I just wanna give credit to our clients because I think that they're all really, really eager to be compliant and want to help us in any way possible. So, I mean, with our clients, they've, they've always said like, well, you know, I. I want to learn. I want to make sure I'm doing everything right. You know, um, I'm willing to learn whatever softwares I need to. So I just wanted to give them credit and um, 
I mean, obviously I've, here and there you run into people who maybe aren't as interested, but we've had really great luck with we, those clients. And I mean, it's no coincidence that those clients also value our services yeah. as well. So yeah, we, we had a client in particular thinking about one in um, Vermont who uh, when she started, she one of the first things she asked us is send us send me a list of all the systems I'll be using and I'm going to learn mm-hmm. about how to use them and um, which is like, that's such a breath of fresh air yeah. <laughs> when, when you're, you know, when they're mm-hmm. eager to learn it, um, uh, it's so refreshing. And then, yeah, like for this client too, um, we can, you know, she's been really wonderful in referring us to other people. So it's, it's just like what the people that really appreciate it do appreciate you. Um, and as, as CPAs, they appreciate your expertise. No, that's awesome. And I think too, well, that, when you said that it reminded me of, um, I know Alyssa, who I, I'm friends with, she's actually going to be on the podcast. She talks about hiring the right client and really making sure, because yeah, you you want to get the people that are excited about the industry, building mm-hmm. their company, but also want to do it right. And mm-hmm. like Betsy just said, you know, I mean, it's you could have an invoice from say a plumbing company on the farm that's going to show, maybe the plumbing company forgets to do it for three months. And all of a sudden you get in September, Mm -hmm. that invoice for $60,000 and it's August 31 or whatever. And you don't even have any idea this is coming. So it's awfully hard to run your business and plan for cash flow. If Mm -hmm. you, if you're just surprised by these bills and and then it can, you know, I've seen people where it's just like, it's a sinking feeling like, oh my gosh, yeah. I got this bill from, I've seen attorneys do this, not bill for months and then hit yeah. you with a massive bill and you're like, holy crud, I didn't plan for this. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> that's, um, well, I think we've, we've hit a ton of our topics. Do you have anything you want to tell either about, well, anything else to share, um, any of your experience in dope CFO, um, or, or for anyone who's thinking about cannabis accounting in general? Yeah, I'll say that we, both Mark and I have had a great experience in dope CFO. I, the, the value in being able to, um, ask a question to a group of people and get a response that day is, um, I mean, it's invaluable. So it's really um, comforting for us to know that we have the resources to get our questions answered for our clients. We never feel like we're alone in this journey. Echoing kind of what she's saying is, is um, you know, it's us connecting with Dope CFO has been really huge, just you know, personally as well as professionally. Um, you know, just last week I was at, um, we went to um, a cannabis event in New York um, and met up with one of the other dope CFOers who who happened to be there. And, and um, you know, we've been doing work together, but also um, it's just it, like, it's cool to have friends in different cities around the country. So, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's been really rewarding in, in so many different ways. Well, yeah. And it's, that's been huge to me because at first when this started out for the first couple of years, it was very small. And um, we, the community, like we talk in our, our group or whatever, but when we started even, I don't know, two, a couple of years ago, we all met. I remember I met you all and we had dinner at Delmonico's yeah. and yeah. it was so much fun to meet and start developing these friendships and community. And then where we've evolved to today, even as I teach on AICPA with some of the bigger firms is like, Oh, because I used to tell people this even a couple of years ago. It's like they're I'd say like, oh, the big firms, they're not here yet. But when they are, they'll go right past us. But now I don't feel that at all there. I don't think they're going to catch up for more than a decade just due to the demographics and their, their staffing shortage. And so it's kind of cool to know we have that expertise. We can share work and knowledge, but then we can also develop friendships Um and because I've had a ball this year being at more events. I think I've been at five, four or five events and every single one I've met other VIPs. We go to happy hour. We'll go out to dinner or whatever. Yeah. So that's, that's definitely a, um, a huge, huge value add that what we, we like doing together. And then just believing in this niche, the, the industry is growing. It's going to keep growing. We've got an election coming up here and we'll, we'll see what happens. One final question, just on that point, I meant to ask you that on Minnesota, are they, is there anything they're voting on right now? It's still medical. I know. 
Yeah, we we had a, a bill that passed that legalized um, edibles and and beverages up to five milligrams, although it's not it's hemp derived. So it's not the the full you know adult use legal bill. Um, there's there is an adult use bill that kind of stalled at, at uh, con- in Congress last year. Uh, depending on how the election comes out this year, maybe it'll go through next year, but it's it's kind of a waiting game. But yeah, that just that that um, five milligram bill has um, awakened things quite a bit in Minnesota where people are talking about cannabis. People are asking I, me and Betsy like, oh, is that really doing real well for you guys? Uh, are people asking a lot of questions? And and for us, it's like, yeah, but it's it's just barely scraping the tip of the iceberg of what it could be compared to other states. So it's, um, well, yeah. I think um, I'll... I'll leave it there, but the um, I did a thing on our Facebook Live today about uh, if you go to Wikipedia and you look at, I think you type in cannabis timeline or something, it's really interesting to go back 100 years ago. What happened 100 years ago? Cannabis was legal. And then states started illegalizing it. And it took about 30 years for states to, and it was interesting, the first states to criminalize cannabis were, was California. And some of the states that were the first to decriminalize were the first states to join. And then the other interesting thing I saw on that Wikipedia, the Gallup polls from when I've been, I'm 58, they started at 1969. I think they had 8% of Americans want illegal cannabis and just, you could just see this line um, and where we are today, it's about 75%. It's just gone up the last 50 years um, for good reason. So, um, well, it's super great to have you all on here. Um, if you're going to be in Las Vegas coming up, I will definitely be here. We're going to have a ton of fun there in a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, hope to see we'll you all there. there. Yeah, we'll definitely be there, Andrew. We look forward to yeah. seeing you again. We're going to have a super great time. Um, thank you all so much. This has been super invaluable. Um, and for for those business owners out there, I would encourage you, we will have all your stuff in the show notes to reach out to Mark and Betsy. Um, I know they are doing world-class work. Um, and I love hearing about all the things you all are doing because this is what these clients need. And that's kind of our basic premise is, there's a lot of these companies are five to 10 million or more in capitalization or revenues, and they need help, whether they know it or not. <laughs> they need good accounting and tax. And, and the IRS, oh, by the way, is coming to visit you. So you better be ready um, when they come. <laughs> For sure. 